This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. We did win this election. So our goal now is to ensure the integrity for the good of this nation. After a long night of counting, it's clear that we're winning enough states to reach 270 electoral votes needed to win the presidency. I'm not here to declare that we've won, but I am here to report when the count is finished, we believe we will be the winners. Both presidential candidates believe they've won this election. With votes still being counted in key states, the Trump administration has filed lawsuits in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Georgia, and they're demanding recounts in Wisconsin. Where is this election headed? What can we expect in the days ahead? Joining us with analysis is political commentator, author, and director of the documentary Trump Card, Dinesh D'Souza. Dinesh, good to have you back. Many Democrats in all the polls had predicted a blue wave across the country. That didn't materialize. Why not, do you think? I think it's because the the narrative that the Democrats were trying to sell the American people on um, was unconvincing. Uh, they thought that they had uh, gotten their message through. They thought that with the dominance they enjoy in the media, that there would be no public resistance. Uh, but, you know, voting is a time when the public gets to speak back. And this was kind of a vote of no confidence uh, in the kind of bright new socialist future that the Democrats were promising. Mm. And this repudiation is pretty much across the board, which is I, why I find it odd that they seem to be saying, well, you know, the all our other candidates were repudiated. But, you know, Joe Biden, he was the exception. People really liked that guy. Mm -hmm. Are you surprised at how close the election is, these tight margins? Talk to me about the two candidates, what they did in the closing days that might have contributed to this, these tight margins we're seeing in these battleground states. I mean, look, uh, Joe Biden hid through most of this campaign. When he came out, he was basically slick ads, media cover, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and a few drive-in speeches that were a bit wobbly. On the other side, you had the populist barnstorming president turning out his base, tens of thousands of people across the country. Uh, what happened here in the end, do you think? I do think that the first debate was bad for Trump. He seemed mm -hmm. too interruptive, too acerbic, uh, a little bit out of control. And I think that that um, alienates some people in the middle uh, who think that it's unpresidential or perhaps even divisive. Mm -hmm. The left's whole project here has been to say that the country is divided and people are also uh, going crazy, all this rioting and so on, because of Trump. And so anything that Trump does to support that idea is obviously not going to be politically uh, good for him. There's no question that the political calculus of this year has been changed by coronavirus. I think had it not been for coronavirus, Trump would have cruised to a pretty easy victory. Mm -hmm. uh, as the case was, it uh, essentially wrecked the Trump economy, put this kind of new factor into things, allowed the Democrats ultimately to change the rules in terms of voting, flooding the country with mail-in ballots. So the bottom line of it is we're in a very anomalous situation topped off with a very anomalous election. Yeah. As I mentioned, the Trump campaign has already filed, filed lawsuits in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Georgia. This was Rudy Giuliani speaking in Pennsylvania on Wednesday regarding the continued counting going on in the state. Watch. Not a single Republican has been able to look at any one of these mail ballots. They could be from Mars as far as we're concerned. I've never heard of a count where you're ahead by 400,000 with 80 plus percent counted and they haven't called it for you yet. They called California the moment it came, it opened, the polls closed. Now, this was the president's argument, Dinesh, from early on in this race, that mail-in ballots were going to be a problem. And indeed, we're getting stories of people, multiple ballots sent to their homes, sent from other states where they used to live. Obviously, all votes need to be counted. Does the Trump camp have a real argument here, one that could prevail? 
I, I hope so. Uh, I realize that courts are often driven by procedural concerns. They're obviously one of the things they have to consider is what can really be done with only two months before the inauguration. Mm -hmm. That seems to be the sort of drop dead date to get all of this fixed. Mm -hmm. um, but I think Trump was prescient to say even before the election that this was going to happen. At the time, I thought it was a little premature, um, but it turns out it was prescient. Mm -hmm. Now, the left keeps sort of saying, oh, yeah, you know what? We just got to all move on. It's time to heal and move on, and we're going to hear a deafening um, message to this effect. But you can't move on when you think the process has been unfair. You know, you can live with the result when the rules are fair. If I come in sixth in a race, it's fine wow. as long as I got to start on the same line. The clock mm -hmm. went off and the gun went on, and the finish. The guy who came in first got the gold medal. So right. the way to make us heal is to convince the losing side that the process was fair. Hmm. Yeah, well, the Georgia judge threw out the Trump lawsuit proposed there. The judge in Pennsylvania ruled in favor of the vote watchers that uh, the president wanted there. Nevada, we're just learning, Dinesh, will not release numbers until November 12th. Is that helpful? I mean, shouldn't they have to report by a drop dead date, even a few days after the election? I mean, November 12th? Why not wait till Thanksgiving or Christmas? Well, I mean, it feeds the suspicion that they don't have the votes, so they are sort of manufacturing them. Mm -hmm. The only sort of rational reason to say, listen, we're not ready to count, is that you don't think the stuff in the ballot box is going to do the job for you. Mm -hmm. So this, I think, is what's truly frightening, the idea that elections are being rigged in this country. Uh, we've seen deep state um, machinations, but the idea that our own democracy, our own vote, might be canceled out by illegal votes this is a very personal issue, I think, for most Americans. Uh, they're demanding a recount in Wisconsin, but uh, the former governor there, uh, Scott Walker, said that this, in the last two elections it didn't really change anything. Is the campaign wasting time demanding a recount in Wisconsin? I'm not sure, although it's, I, th I see what Walker is saying is, I think what he's saying is that this is not a case where a ballot has been incorrectly marked one way that mm -hmm. then goes the other way. Right. That kind of thing, if it occurs, is very episodic. I'm more worried about more systematic types of cheating, mm -hmm. flooding the country with mail-in ballots, blocking people from observing them, and allowing the fraudulent ballots and the real ballots to be thrown into the same heap. Well, uh, look, I've spoken to an attorney representing people in Michigan, several poll watchers, one of whom claims, it's a claim at this point, he alleges that uh, poll workers were filling out ballots, which they were then putting into the pile for counting. Uh, there were other people who came across ballots, you know, with people born in 1902 or 1921 who have long been dead. Uh, what's happening in Arizona and Michigan? Are you concerned about the validity of the count there and the ballots being considered? Well, once you see something happening here and there and in other places, you begin to get the suspicion, what are all the places that's been going on that I don't know about? In other words, how widespread is this problem really? Mm -hmm. Now, looking back at 2016, of course, we didn't see a whole lot of this, but I think in retrospect, it's because the Democrats expected to win. They were sort of taken by surprise mm -hmm. at Trump kind of pulling it off. But this time, it seems like they were ready. And from the beginning, they've been talking about things. Think about their the eagerness with which they proclaimed Trump. Trump must not declare victory on election night. Why do they think that this was an important problem to prevent? It's almost like they had it all figured out. Their plan was sort of in place. Uh, and so the, the worry here is that we're dealing with systematic and not just episodic abuse. Hmm. Um, I, I agree with you. Look, I think the media, the polling establishment, these political consultants, all of that was also on the ballot this time. And they have failed. I mean, the, the media coverage not holding Biden accountable to things they held Trump accountable for. I mean, we had we had international and national investigations of every allegation against Trump. It was fully vetted. It was every night on the news. Biden, things would pop up. No consideration. His mental acuity, no coverage at all. These things, it seems, are a failure to the public and therefore to the republic itself going to the voting box. You don't know who you're voting for. I want to turn attention to some of the demographics that uh, played out in this election, as well as a few issues. The economy was the number one issue for people going into the election. How much do you think that affects uh, the final vote? And did the COVID-19 uh, layer upon the economy, did that hurt Trump, do you think? 
Well, the economy is almost always the critical issue. Mm -hmm. I think in this case, the economy was uh, important to Republicans, but it would have been important to Democrats also had it been Trump's old economy. The problem is that COVID made a sort of living uh, destruction of that economy. Mm -hmm. And so the Democrats were able to sort of point to all this, uh, all these people at home and all the suffering caused by coronavirus, but nevertheless try to pin the blame on Trump. Yeah. So coronavirus was a definite setback. I think it's also the case that coronavirus was a chance to say 200,000 people are dead, Trump, you're the president, ergo, you bear the responsibility for 200,000 deaths. And that's a difficult hole to dig yourself out of, even if you're able to say, I took the reasonable measures. The fact of the matter is you do have those casualties, you do have those deaths. So this has been a this was an uphill kind of environment for Trump to succeed. It's remarkable that he's done as well with yeah. the terrifying array of forces against him. The idea that this election is basically a draw, I think, shows the stunning achievement of Trump and of the Republican Party. Yeah, no, that, uh, it, the margins are so razor thin here. It is amazing, given the media uh, amplification of Biden, the protection of Biden in some ways, uh, and the... The, the 90, look, polls, uh, the, the studies tell us 95 percent of the coverage of Donald Trump is negative in the media at large. That's an awful hard thing to overcome for a candidate. Regarding demographics, preliminary 2020 election exit polls, and look, this doesn't take into account the write-in people, the people who filled in the ballots, released Wednesday, suggests that Trump lost about four percentage points in evangelical support compared to 2016, but gained in key demographics, such as Catholics, Protestants, blacks, and Latinos. Trump still carried the evangelical vote 76 uh, percent. To what do you attribute the loss of points among evangelicals? I think it's hard to underestimate the the Jerry Falwell liberty uh, factor. Mm. Uh, Jerry Falwell was perhaps the most prominent evangelical in Trump's camp. Uh, and um, there's no question that the influence of liberty through its students online as well as on campus stretches throughout the country. So a 4% shift could be attributable to that alone. Mm -hmm. And among African-American voters, the president received 12% support compared to 8% in 2016. Among Latinos, he went up four percentage points to 32% in 2016. He had 28%. What were the issues, do you think, that helped him with both the Latino and the African-American voter. I think the biggest factor was simply the willingness of Trump to speak ordinary language and mm. campaign directly for those votes. Mm. It is amazing how Republicans often ignore um, the Latino vote. My wife is from the Rio Grande Valley in South Texas. A lot of times the Republican Party doesn't even go down there. Right. And the Republican candidate, with no help from the party, got 42 percent of the vote against the Democrat. Those There are winnable seats even in heavily and exclusively Latino districts. Now, the black vote is harder. Kim Klasik, who ran in Baltimore, got 17 percent against Kwesi Mfume. So that's, that's going to be a little tougher. But if the Republicans could, could target 20 percent of the black vote and 50 percent of the Latino vote, think of the implications of that for the long-term future of the party. Yeah, no. And I also think don't underestimate the Kanye, 50 Cent, uh, uh, little, little Wayne effect, which I think normalized the president in a very toxic environment for many black voters and black men in particular. You see those numbers in the, in the exit polls. We'll see how it finally shakes out. Now, the Catholic vote usually decides a presidential election, Dinesh. The early exit polling data suggests that 62 percent of Catholics surveyed cast their ballots for Trump. Only 37 percent voted for Biden. AP uh, VoteCast claims the Catholic vote broke 46 for Trump, 52 to Biden. We'll see. Your thoughts on all of this? Well, I think this would make the Catholic vote even more surprising in view of the fact that this was something that Biden stressed about himself, that he is a sort of, he is a Catholic, it's important to him. And so for Catholics to vote against a Catholic and to vote for Trump on the basis of moral values and an alignment of positions, I think this would represent something very important. So uh, Catholics, I think, believe in normalcy, believe in economic normalcy, mm -hmm. uh, believe in, in security on the international front, believe in not only the free society, but the decent society. So mm -hmm. in other words, freedom compatible with moral order. And it's becoming increasingly clear that the Democrats are in moving away from that 
sort of philosophy, uh, mm -hmm. at least in actions, if not in words. Assuming those numbers hold, let's say the New York Times exit poll, just for the sake of argument, is correct, and that 62 percent of the Catholic vote went to Trump. How could he lose ground in Michigan and Wisconsin when in each of those states that's 20 or 25 percent Catholic? It could have helped him in Pennsylvania, by the way, also, where he's got a bit of a lead. The people I know who are in Michigan and Wisconsin, I speak frequently in those states, uh, are in disbelief. They don't think it rings true. And then they look at things like, you know, uh, that Wisconsin's vote climbed from the normal range of 60 to 70 percent to somehow 89 percent of eligible voters. In other words, ridiculous and improbable spikes. Um, and so even granted that there is some increase in voting, it's not to that extent. Mm. Uh, you know, this has the improbability of you find 100,000 votes and they're all for Biden. They're, the odds of that are so preposterously low that on prima facie, it's evidence of fraud. Mm -hmm. I want to shift attention to the House and Senate races, something you don't hear a lot of talk about. The Democrats predicted they would flip the Senate. Most of the polls said they would. They didn't. Doesn't seem that way anyway. The Senate remains virtually unchanged. What does this tell you? Should Biden win, he's going to face that blockade of a Republican Senate. And it's a very important blockade, although you can only imagine the sort of frightening pressure that the Senate will be under from the mm. media uh, to submit. Uh, Republicans have held the line. And think of the oceans of money that were put in to defeat Lindsey Graham, to defeat Mitch McConnell. So unheard of amounts of money in which the challenger is got three, four and five times the amount of cash of the incumbent. So mm -hmm. the fact that Republicans held those seats, I think, is just a measure of yeah. the degree to which the public was delivering a repudiation of the Democratic agenda. On Wednesday, House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy had this to say about the significant gains the Republican made in the House following election night. Now, I've heard for months from the pollsters and the media about how Republicans were going to lose more seats and cling to shrinking coalitions. As of right now, we have seven GOP pickups. We also have 11 outstanding races that I feel very confident that will continue to grow and win. To what do you attribute those Republican gains? Is that the idea that the voter likes to have checks and balances uh, in their government, on the national level at yeah. least? That might be part of it. I think it's also that the Republicans are now fielding better candidates. Mm. Um, they used to basically try to just sort of yank somebody off the Chamber of <laughs> Commerce or find some rich guy who had some money, loose cash lying around and say, hey, would you run? But now they're actually looking for young, dynamic candidates who I think reflect the future of the GOP. Um, people who are who have not a dynamism, are well qualified, are well spoken, are media savvy, are social media savvy. So the Republican Party is shifting. It's becoming actually more a party of the working class, not just the white mm -hmm. working class, mm -hmm. but the working class generally. And so I, I think its long term future is very bright, not no matter what happens in this election. Yeah. No, I saw that in Minnesota. I saw it in Michigan. I saw it in Tampa, Florida. The huge outpouring of Latinos during this election season was something, and they were very vocal in their, in their uh, shift. Many of them had been Democratic voters who moved to the Republican Party. So uh, let's, let's project a little bit here. If Biden wins, has the president really lost in that he has reshaped the Republican Party and laid down the marker for this populist vision going forward? He hasn't lost in that sense. In fact, I think it's I would almost go so far as to say that any Republican now who sits on the sidelines and is sort of absent from this particular fight has no real future in the leadership of the GOP. So it's a Trump GOP and it's been redefined in many ways. Mm -hmm. Even its fighting spirit, I think, is something that Trump has taught the Republicans. There's no reason to be so timorous to run away every time a reporter calls. You have to march straight at these guys. You're going to get the best result, if you will, on the front line. Mm -hmm. So there are some lasting lessons. Uh, so I don't think it's all bad no matter what. But of course, I think a second Trump victory is a is a justified a vindication of what Trump has accomplished mm -hmm. over the past four years and a necessary repudiation of the media and of the left. Well, we will leave it there. We'll see how this shakes out. Thank you for being with us and for your commentary. Trump Card, the documentary by Dinesh D'Souza, is out now on DVD and video on demand. More information can be found at DineshD'Souza.com. Thank you, Dinesh. My pleasure.